Apostasy and Antichrist, an Orthodox Explanation of the Coming Apocalypse, written in 1978 by Archimandrite Pantelaimon, translated into English in 1992, and published by Holy Trinity Monastery, Jordanville, New York. Translator's Preface First, beware of this. In the last days, scoffers will enter, saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For all things continue to be as they were since the dawn of creation. True to this prophecy of the holy apostle Peter, there are now many such scoffers amongst us. There are even many who bear the name Christian, who have, nevertheless, ceased to hope on the return of Christ. Now they are planning better things of their own. Having resolved that there will be no God-created new heaven and new earth, these scoffers have decided to forge a man-created new world in the same way that Protestantism decided to build a man-created church in opposition to the Church of Christ. To this, St. Paul admonishes, Let no man deceive you by any means. That day will not come before there first comes the great apostasy and that man who is sin personified is revealed, the inheritor of perdition who will oppose himself to and exalt himself above all that is called divine or that is worshipped by man, even sitting in the temple of God, claiming to be a God himself. Therefore, brethren, stand firm and hold fast to all the traditions which you have been taught, whether by word or by our epistle. Are the last days upon us? Is the son of perdition, Antichrist, about to appear? An increasing number of Orthodox Christians express an affirmative reply to this question. The reasons for this apocalyptic feeling are many and are quite valid. This view differs sharply from the emotional expectations of the return of Christ, which occurred on occasions in past centuries, particularly during the fall of Rome and at the fall of Constantinople. The apocalyptic views in those particular times were based upon immediate physical sufferings and terror, rather than upon a sound analysis of obviously fulfilled prophecies of the Holy Scripture. Until this century, there had been fulfilled very few of the specific prophecies of Christ, the Holy Apostles, and the Fathers of the Church, related to the culmination of time and the second advent of Christ. Yet the prophecies of the Holy Scripture have always been made clear to the faithful by means of iconic prototypes before they have been actually fulfilled. Now it seems that even the last and most difficult to understand of these prophecies have been clarified by actual, historical events in our own century. What appeared to be unfathomable mysteries in the book of Revelation are no longer such mysteries, for even the most startling and unbelievable of these things have been and are being experienced in our present time. For example, both Christians and materialists have long agreed that the existing order and civilization will perish as a result of a massive holocaust, a holocaust described in the Holy Scripture in such massive, terrifying, universal, and all-encompassing terms that, before Dresden, Hiroshima, Bikini, and other manifestations of the napalm and nuclear age, the description simply transcended the mind and imagination of mankind. The Orthodox Christian Church has always taught that the cause of such a destruction will be the religious and moral decay of humanity, that the time would arrive when vast segments of the Holy Orthodox Church would apostatize, when a counter-church, formed under Satan's leadership, would arise and when evil will reign so strongly in the life of mankind that life on earth will become virtually impossible. Then the world will lose its right and its reason for existence. The destruction will come about according to God's sentence, but the cause of the sentence will be the evil of mankind. Materialists point to the application of nuclear arms as the means of this destruction. 
but only people who have gone insane with evil could resort to such armaments. Consequently, even according to the ideas of learned materialists, the cause of the destruction of order and civilization will be a humanity which has fallen into evil. Contemporary material science has arrived at a confirmation of the Orthodox Christian view and, de facto, though unwillingly, testified to the correctness of the Holy Scripture. This can only strengthen true Orthodox Christians in the conviction that everything else which the Holy Church teaches concerning the culmination of time will also come to pass. Our faith and the facts and events of our time convince us that the Great Tribulation will occur in the near future. In the Holy Scripture, we read that the beginning of the illness, that is, the beginning of the culmination of the ages, will be general, terrible wars, geophysical and social miseries. The words of this prophecy are being fulfilled before our eyes that periods of war and elementary misery have occurred often before this century is of no consequence to our view. Contemporary wars and miseries differ sharply from wars and disasters of earlier times by the fact that they possess an almost universal nature and also by their terrible power, which at once brings to mind the possibility of universal catastrophe. The general or world war is strictly a phenomenon of the 20th century. It is only with the advent of the incredible universality and unbelievable destructive forces loosed by these general wars that the prophecies of Revelation 9, 15 to 21 become fathomable. Even the destruction of Dresden with the horrifying firestorms once staggered the imagination and these firestorms were caused by what mankind can now casually refer to as conventional weapons. Concerning the fulfillment of such prophecies, our attention must also turn to Revelation 8, 7-12, and the ninth chapter, where the visionary, St. John, persistently emphasizes that various disasters and miseries will descend upon one-third of mankind and upon one-third of the earth's surface at the beginning of the culmination of time. If one considers, says Father Alexander Kolesnikov, those nations and peoples which have become a sacrifice to wars and revolutions in the 20th century, then it will be seen that they make up approximately one-third of the earth's surface and population. Indeed, in the last decade alone, we have observed the fulfillment of Revelation 8, 7-12, for scientists have revealed to us that mankind, as a result of pride and greed, has paved, stripped, or poisoned nearly one-third of the arable land surface, has caused, by pollution, a substantial reduction in the quantity of solar energy which reaches the earth, i.e., reduce the amount of sunshine, and is well on the way to having poisoned fully one-third of the seas, killing the living creatures which dwell in them. It is worthy of our attention that the disasters of the 20th century have descended primarily upon Christian peoples. As a result of the experiences of these peoples during the first half of this century, millions of Christians have become skeptical, lost their faith, and turned cold toward God and each other. Most especially, the permanent disasters, which include true martyrdoms and open warfare against the Church, have befallen Orthodox Christian nations, almost entirely in the first half of the 20th century, and generally as one of the results of the First General War. Communism captured all of Eastern Europe and the Caucasus before 1950. Nor was Greece spared, for the Venezuelans and several defiled church leaders launched their attacks upon Holy Orthodoxy in Greece in the 1920s, almost as if to counter the holy teaching and saintly example of St. Nectarios of Pentapolis. Alexandria, Antioch, and the church in China have also fallen under communist-controlled government since the Second General War. One cannot help but have the impression that the evil forces of the world 
have set themselves to the task of weakening the Orthodox Christian peoples in order to remove the main obstacle to the realization of their future plans. In addition to the shock of world events and of man's inhumanity to his fellow man, authors of anti-Christian philosophical, political, and religious theories and systems have attacked Christianity especially heavily in recent times. For the most part, these philosophers have taught, and still are teaching, that a law of progress reigns in the history of mankind. Accordingly, humanity, in all aspects of its existence, has, throughout its history, evolved upward. These philosophers teach that the political, social, and ideological forms of the life of the human race are continually improving, and that man will eventually find and bring about, by his own power and human development, the most complete and ideal political and social order of life, an order in which reason, science, peace, safety, justice, and material well-being will be complete. As a matter of fact, a large number of defiled, nominal Orthodox Christian leaders have begun to present such thesis. Most notable amongst these are hierarchs of the present ecumenical patriarchate, which has begun to teach these things so as to lead astray, if possible, even the elect. Christ, on the other hand, taught something completely the opposite. Christ foretold that there would be wars and rumors of wars, that there would be not peace, but the sword that the love of many will grow cold because of the violence of mankind. Let us look at the history of the 20th century and ask, who has been proven to be right, Christ or the wistful philosophers? There has arrived no reign of reason, but rather a reign of the most coarse materialism and animalistic passions in man. In place of peace and safety, there are terrible wars and the almost daily rumor of new wars. Instead of justice, we have witnessed violence, rioting, Cheka, the Gestapo, GPU, mass executions, concentration camps, Siberian exile camps of a new and indescribable severity, chemical obliterations of the minds of confessors of the faith and of other dissenters in the USSR. Instead of material well-being, There are regular reports of mass starvations and deprivations of millions, in spite of the fact that a large segment of mankind has food to throw away, two homes, two or three automobiles, etc. Instead of accord with the reason of religion, there is the almost daily appearance of sex with the darkest of teachings, I am, Freemasonry, Theosophy, Baha'i, Open Satan Worship, and witchcraft cults to name only a few. What is more significant is the fact that the will to resist all these evil movements has begun to leave mankind. Now people can accept Satan cults with little or no shock, pausing only briefly to be dismayed or transitorily horrified at the literal cannibalism which has occurred in the United States as a result of these cults or the insane murders which only recently occurred in California. Week by week, month by month, the number of deaths or terrible satanic acts practiced in satanic cults mounts up, and society at large does not really trouble itself about these things. That society in general is willing to condone satanic acts is clearly demonstrated in that abortion, the mass extermination of babies, has not only ceased to shock most people, but has even become accepted as a norm. Moreover, it is becoming unfashionable to be anti-communist, and those who keep faith with the holy new martyrs in the communist world are scoffed at and ridiculed. Could it be that the love of many has already grown cold? Could it be that the season of the great famine, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but for the hearing of the word of God, is already upon the world of mankind? Could it be that the reign of Antichrist is virtually upon us? 
The prophecies of the Holy Scripture concerning the kingdom of Antichrist were, in the past, beyond the reach of man's understanding. The Bible gives us pictures of terrible things which will occur in the kingdom of Antichrist, and the fathers of the church present us with warnings and descriptions of enslavement and persecutions not easily grasped by the imagination. Yet are all these pictures and descriptions so unbelievable? This brings us to the point of this book, to show that these prophecies are, in fact, no longer unbelievable, but are now comprehensible and that their fulfillment is actually observable in the world today. Here the author presents, in clear, easily understandable terms, the origin of evil and its struggle against good and its culmination in the reign of Antichrist. We are primarily interested in warning Orthodox Christian people about the impending tribulations for mankind and of the rise of Antichrist. In order to do this, it is necessary first to introduce people to an understanding of the person of Satan and to biblical demonology. For without a concept of demonology, it is not possible to comprehend the Christology, the ecclesiology, or the eschatology of the Holy Church, which are absolutely inseparable from the message of salvation. In order to carry out this task, the monk who prepared this work has compiled material which is easy to understand and which is not obscured in technical terminology. He has not compiled for the musing of intellectuals, but for the saving of souls. No one will read this work and fail to be disturbed by it. For the thinking, concerned Orthodox Christian, it will be well to turn now to the service books of the Holy Church, for in them the traditions and the conscience of the Church speak on all these matters, teaching, admonishing, and expounding sound doctrines for the defense of all true believers. Above all, the reader must be led to redouble his prayer life and cling all the more steadfastly to all the traditions which you have been taught. Glory to God for everything. The Visible Universe as a Revelation About the Creator The unbegotten and uncreated God, living in Holy Trinity, being all-powerful and wholly perfect, is completely self-sufficient and had no need of created beings. His infinite love, however, longed to have participants in His eternal blessedness. For this reason, God prepared His heavenly kingdom and created the heavenly beings. Love is not coercive. It does not force love from others. All of God's created beings, the angels, were made with free wills. This was necessary so that they could render true love to their Creator, rather than a mindless, meaningless obedience. One of the brightest and most powerful of these angels, Lucifer, Satan, exercising his free will, chose to love himself instead of God. Because of his self-love, he became self-willed, and being self-willed, he became ambitious and resolved to create a new kingdom in opposition to that of God, even usurping God's position and power. The consequences of this act of rebellion, apostasy, are well known to all. Lucifer and his followers were cast out of heaven and remain today as the enemies of God and of all his creatures. The temptation and disobedience of Lucifer infected many of the heavenly beings so that the new kingdom of evil was filled with disciples of the Prince of Darkness. Those who stood firm during the destructive temptations were strengthened by God's help and became eternal sons of truth. According to the love of the Creator, the heavenly kingdom could not remain unfulfilled, and in order to effect its fulfillment, God created a new creature, man. Adam and Eve were brought forth from nothing into a universe especially created for them, and they appeared as the jewels in the crown of the Creator's works. The grandeur of the Creator was revealed even in the basic atoms, which, though formless, invisible, and in disarray, 
served as the material for the establishing of all nature and man himself. Creation We do not know the original state of the void universe or how long the elements existed in chaotic conditions. For the Holy Scripture commences its history at the time when the life-giving Holy Spirit was already moving across the face of the deep, ordering the universe. The history of the visible world, however, actually begins with the formation of the simple particles. That the elements which surround us today comprise nothing more than formless particles in the beginning is evident from the testimony of God's Word, Proverbs 8.26. Scientific investigations of the realm of nature have confirmed this testimony that the elements of the world are composed of a single type of material, i.e., they have a singleness of nature. These insignificant, tangible particles were gifted by the Creator with a strength of action incomprehensible to us. As a result, they formed from their unions, joinings, and partings, a countless variety of forms and bodies in the natural realm. The physical creation of light, with energies emanating from it, occurred on the first day of the creation in response to God's word, let there be light. On the fourth day of creation, the light gathered into great bodies, which were foreordained to rule other, lesser bodies, which were taken from them, to rule by means of attraction, to heat and illuminate them. These great bodies we call the so-called fixed stars, of which our own sun is one. The waters of the great atomic ocean, submitting to God's command and the action of His Holy Spirit, divided and ordered into various great bodies, and these, in turn, divided into the multitude of planets and like bodies on the second day of creation. On the third day, by an evaporation and mixing of the waters from the seas which covered the land, there were created air, clouds, and fresh water. By God's power, great upheavals cast the continents up from the seas. The third day has a special significance in the creation of the universe, for on that day, vegetation began on the earth. The earth produced the first and most luxuriant fruit for the use of the inhabitants of the realm of nature. From that day on, the earth, like a good mother, began to spend her energy, at first strong and mighty, for the benefit of humanity and other living creatures. This will continue until that very time when, in the end, the earth is weakened by the carelessness of man in its cultivation and exploitation. Then it will grow poor and weak and will have great difficulty feeding mankind. Yet it will continue to produce until the very end of time, as the scripture says, as long as the earth lasts, sowing and reaping will not cease. Genesis 8.22 The end of time will come upon the earth and find her yielding up her last poor harvest to mankind. The end of this world will not be a destruction, but a restoration and renewal. Revelation 21, 1. Its restored powers will serve eternally for the renewal of the creatures of the new life. The Miracle of Light The radiant beginning commenced on the fourth day. The great bodies of the universe clothed in golden radiance, are appointed to rule smaller ones and to clothe them with light on that side which is turned toward their radiance, leaving in darkness that side which is turned away. But no place is deprived of the opportunity of receiving the benefits and illumination poured forth by the sun, for the lesser bodies were assigned rotary motion on their own sloping axis and a yearly migration around the central globe from which they were called forth. By means of these double motions, the planets are gifted with changes of season and of days and nights, all of which are necessary for their temporary existence, for the renewal of their weakened physical strengths and to enable nature to execute its temporary assignment. By these movements, 
every point on the Earth's surface falls under the actions of the sun's rays. There is a diversity in the energy of the rays, for their contact is either direct or indirect at an angle, so that various belts on the Earth's surface receive more or less light and warmth. This phenomenon of nature reveals that in miracles of physical light, the Creator has shown us a likeness, icon, of the wonders of the light of divinity. Sensible, intelligent creatures are by themselves darkness, i.e., not only darkness, but having no light of their own whatever. Only upon receiving inner illumination and warmth from the Spirit do they cease to be in dark and approach that moral beauty which was ordained for them according to the plan of the economia of the Creator. The division of the white light into seven bright colors reminds us of the seven blessed gifts of the Holy Spirit, which strengthen the soul by means of the holy mysteries of the Church, so that it, the soul, might grow in virtue for the glory of God. Each visible object manifests a hue according to that object's own inner ability to reflect one or the other of the rays of the seven-colored spectrum. So with the spirit of man. In itself, it is dark and would remain a dark object were it not for God's gift of grace which allows man's soul to receive this blessed light and warmth from its creator. The light of man's soul, like the light of the moon, is reflected from the spiritual sun, the sun of truth. Without this gift, the soul would remain in darkness, despondency, despair, and evil. Just as no point on earth is deprived of the possibility of receiving the life-giving rays of the sun, so no intelligent being is denied the possibility, if he wishes, of receiving the life-giving spiritual sun, the creator and savior of mankind. The first man turned away from the sun of truth and fell into a realm of moral darkness. From that time until the advent of Christ, the never-setting sun, very few people turned toward this light. Man became accustomed to the conditions of moral darkness which were more convenient for doing evil, so much that he got to like his chains and shackles. Those who did choose light over darkness grieved heavily at the sight of God's created image enslaved by moral darkness. These holy ones yearned for the time which was promised to man when the blessed light would be made manifest and provided to all those who had not completely lost the ability to accept the spiritual light of truth. How fortunate our own era has been as compared with the centuries before the advent of the promised light, Christ Jesus. In Orthodox Christian countries, which were long ago converted to the light of truth, people had the opportunity to grow up accepting the light. Here in the heterodox countries of the West, this is not the case, for we are surrounded by the darkness of those who have rejected Christ's church and who even struggle against it. We are surrounded by customs and traditions which are completely adverse to the Holy Orthodox Church, and for this reason, we must turn back upon the traditions of Orthodox Christian countries in order to truly accept this light of truth. Of course, it has never been without a struggle that we accept the abundance of Christ. There has always been the unseen warfare, but where is the field of this struggle? Where must one go to battle? The battlefield is within us. We recognize it in feelings, thoughts, intentions, and sensations. Darkness appears in words and deeds which reflect our actual condition, a condition alien to the actual tint which Christ, the Son of Truth, imprints upon our thoughts, words, and deeds. It was pleasing to the Almighty Creator of the universe to trace out, in visible manifestations, the mysteries of the invisible world, revealing how, before a multitude of stars fell from heaven, just as now a multitude of souls are falling away from the Holy Orthodox Church. Yet for all those which fall away, we have assurance from the Creator Himself that no enemy forces will be able to destroy the Church 
even to the last day.